This week, my friend Jason takes us from Des Moines to Beijing and back again with just one word in his back pocket. It's gonna be amazing. These are your friends and neighbors. Stepping on a meatloaf's rust brown Eagle 10XL tour bus for a week long sprint across the Midwest was the realization of my 16 year old self's wildest dreams. Unfortunately, I'd arrived nearly 20 years too late and Meatloaf had long since sold the bus. On the bright side, my friends Jason Wallsmith and bandmate Mike Butterworth had recently purchased Meat's bus and invited me to open for their band, The Nadas, on tour. I couldn't believe my luck. That as the meme goes is how it started. Ten days later, as the bus pulled out of Omaha, Nebraska, I snapped a photograph of my thoroughly overheated, fully depleted, dangerously dehydrated, and completely nauseated reflection in the ceiling mirror, mm -hmm, the ceiling mirror of the rear cabin lounge. The engine roaring below my back, the highway rumbling through my spine, it's hot, my mouth tastes like the underside of a shoe, and I thought I was going to die. And that's how it ends. That photograph is on the back of my 2005 LP Heartland, which Mike and Jason released on their label. My adventures continue to this day with them, from tour buses to taco joints, kitchen tables to the local IV. And now with the internets, I dig a bit deeper into Jason's history, what fuels his wanderlust, gets him through those flat tires, flat notes, and flat beers along the way. Meet Jason Walsmith. I want to start with the start. Take me back a little bit. Where were you were born? What your folks were mm -hmm. like growing up? What they did? I was born in Des Moines, and uh, my parents were small business owners, and they owned a commercial printing company. Right. And I grew up in that commercial printing company in this building downtown. My dad worked there every day, and sometimes worked on the presses. Mostly, he was sort of the executive of the company and tried to drum up business. And my mom, you know, ran the books, did the accounting. It was a two-story building downtown with the whole upper floors were empty. That's the love so just right? That you named one yeah. of the You like recorded one yep. there, right? We made a record there and we recorded a record there. When we were little kids, we had like playrooms. We used to ride our big wheels in the hallways and play hide and seek all over this old building. And it was pretty awesome. It sounds like your parents were in essence entrepreneurs. Were they hustling a lot? Absolutely, they were entrepreneurs, both of them working together there was no such thing as like office hours. They were definitely hustling. My dad was part executive because he was in the breakfast club and he would, you know, go out and shoot, uh, shoot skeet with his business buddies and try to get work. And they had employees, but if they didn't get the job done by the end of the day, he was the one there running the press in his, in his tie with an apron on and, um, you know, ink on his hands. Sometimes he'd work all night. Yeah. For some reason these days, I feel like the word hustle almost has a negative connotation. I'm trying to yeah. figure that out, but yeah. um, but they definitely worked hard and they definitely paved their own way. I actually was just reminiscing with my dad about this today, about the time that I sort of had that heart to heart with my dad where he's like, well, I've been building this business for you. You know, is it something you want? And he didn't put any pressure on me. And I was like, absolutely not. I'm not interested <laughs> in this. Today I asked him, was I appreciative? Was I gracious? Or was I dismissive and like, how did that make you feel? And he's like, no, you were fine. <laughs> but I would say that the path that I took, which is sort of in a way, people from the outside would say night and day different. Today, I was just sort of thinking about how similar it was, you know? It's part of why I asked, but will you elaborate a little bit? How, how do you mean that? They paved their own way. They ate what they killed sort of thing. <laughs> you know, it was a hunt and gather lifestyle in the modern day. And, and that's what I do, you know? Yeah. Um, we just sort of make our own rules and reap those rewards. And I'm not trying to say the rewards are great, but they are self-fulfilling or fulfilling, yeah. you know? I remember times looking back when my parents sort of, to use the modern adage, like pivoted or found new ways to make things work. What I'm interested in is kind of the seeds, right? Of what helped you to become you from a creative and artistic standpoint, music and books and uh, film and television. What was anything playing in the house? Was culture important? Definitely. I would say it was sort of mainstream though. I can tell you my mom, as I was growing up, always had KJJY, the country station on in her 77 Pontiac 
Grand Prix. And my dad pretty much always listened to the the NPR station, but at the time, and it was like the classical, 24-hour classical station. So there was a little bit of that, a little bit of classic country. My mom loved Kenny Rogers, so there was Kenny Rogers playing like on a turntable in our house a lot. There was, I remember ABBA records. I remember uh, yeah. James Taylor, Mudslide Slim, and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Those albums I remember from, like I remember them coinciding with me playing air guitar and jumping off the ottoman. So uh-huh. however old that was, you know, eight, nine, 10, maybe. When did you get an instrument and how did that sort of bug begin to bite? I didn't get a guitar until like the end of high school. And before that I took piano lessons, but it was, it was very, uh, just something I was told I had to do. Yeah, likewise. I, ne- I never thought of it as like a musical thing. I thought of it as a, a pain in the ass, another piece of homework that I had to do. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. sucks. I really wish that I had that right now. Yeah. Know? I wish that was a part of, of what my understanding and appreciation of music. But, but at a very early age, probably like fourth grade, I think I started like getting involved in musicals and, you know, school plays and in church at the same time, they were kind of, doubling down on that so I was in the church choir the little kid church choir and stuff so I was an altar boy because I just with my brother because we just didn't want to go to mass we thought it was more fun to be in it than in front of it right what was the catalyst for you oh I don't think I had a choice I don't think I I don't think it was something I wanted to do I don't (laughs) when did you start doing plays and stuff and why I think that was sort of like in an effort to be you know liked or popular probably or you know (laughs) thank you that's your authentic self Jason (laughs) I don't remember it being something that was like an inner drive in me to like communicate something necessarily. It was more just like a a way to have fun with friends. I have great memories from those church musical experiences. And every summer we'd go on tour with this church choir. So that was my sort of introduction to the road. Was that a like eye opener? It must have been. Yeah, I mean, I still have, I definitely still have good memories from that. Riding in a bus, going from town to town, seeing the sights, um, seeing new places, new people. Did you begin to make the connection to like the potential rock and roll life from there? Or no, you were just like, well, this is good for now. At no point in high school or even the beginning of college did I think that I was going to do anything with music or performance like as an adult. The evolution there or the metamorphosis there came from having, having writing my own songs, I think, because prior to that, I was just sort of performing something that someone was giving me. Right. I think it was that step of writing your own songs and then having people want to hear it. And then that fulfillment of people supporting that and encouraging yeah. that. The, like the validation. Yeah. Definitely. Then I was performing in college. So then I was like, well, at least I'm going to do this during college. But then I remember when I graduated and I was like, well, now I have to get ready for a career. I decided, well, maybe I'll just try it for a little while. It's not going to hurt anything. I'll just have some fun and then I'll get serious about life. I even remember 10 years into the band when I was like, well, we made it 10 years, but now probably I probably should, you know, do the real life thing. Um, Are you doing the real life thing yet? No, well, not really. (laughs) No, I mean, here's here's where I would disagree with you. Yeah. Not everybody's comfortable with new things, but like you got on a train and like did a tour, like you've done tours of living rooms, you know, you've played in the nation's capital on behalf of the, you know, state and you've got to help perform a, you know, state, or I guess city anthem, right? I mean, like you've done a lot of wackazoid things and that's just the music part, right? Like, you know, I was going over the CV, right? There's like DJ and and like photographer and videographer. Like I met you at Sundance, right? You were shooting video. So it's a pretty rich portfolio of capabilities that you've cultivated. I mean, you've got global travel under your belt. So I'm interested in like, did that newness always, was it always attractive to you? Did it never... Were you never blocked by it? I am in it for the adventures. I played Havana, Cuba and Beijing, China in the past two years. I am driven by that adventure for sure. And some people, Mm. I guess their adventure is climbing those mountains. But for me, it's blazing new trails, meeting new people, seeing new things, being surprised. And that's harder and harder to find. Just like, I guess, Uh new frontiers are harder and harder to find. Uh Um, It's harder and harder to find those unique things in the world. But I'm looking for them. Can you give me an example of a time or a scenario when you're like, you know, you're just not sweating the day to day and you're just really in the, in the moment. When does that happen the most for you? I feel like it is happening a lot right now because Mm -hmm. I am finding this sort of balance. You say I've worn all these hats, but my epiphany has been that they're all the same hat. 
It's right. just sort of different tools right. and avenues for at least half of my career post-college in this band and being a photographer, as you mentioned, I was wrestling with who am I? Mm-hmm. But am I a photographer or yeah. am I a musician or am I more of a photographer and trying to hold on to being a musician or am I just a musician who just is a photographer to kind of help pay the bills or, you know, those haunting questions. So it took a long time to like come to the point where I'm like, oh no, this is exactly who I am. Some people are going to see it and some people aren't. Some people are going to question it. Some people aren't going to care. None of those people matter anyway. Yeah. The more I just do what I do, the more those opportunities present themselves to me anyway. Yeah. The more I say yes. Would you say that's your default when somebody sort of makes you an offer or a suggestion or has an idea? Yes, is your sort of natural. I definitely instinct. try to have it be, yeah. I don't want to do anything dangerous or right. dumb. It's like, that's always in the back of your mind a little bit, but no, my default is yes. Yeah. What was the first record, like, I'm guessing it was vinyl, that grabbed you, that just knocked your socks off where you were like, what, what just happened? Can you remember? Some of those ones that I mentioned that were in my parents' record collection definitely Crosby Stills and Ashton Young I remember like my dad saying no listen to this that and that James Taylor record you know yeah. which I which I think was it was at Mudside Slim but it was probably also their greatest hits yeah you know their greatest hits for a reason and John Denver there's definitely some John Denver I think those things imprinted on songwriting for me talk to me a little bit about your songwriting process I don't have a defined process knowing that if I did, I would write more songs. I know if you said, you have to write a song, give it to me by tomorrow. I know that I would just sit down and do that. And yeah. that was a long time coming and it was a lot of hard work to get there. Mm-hmm. These days, I know that if I need to write a song, I will. Um, and then every once in a while, I'm fortunate enough to have a need where I can't not write a song. Just yeah. every once in a while. I keep a now digital notepad of seeds and my songs mostly always start with a a lyrical seed a phrase a A lot of times it's just a title yeah you know or an idea yeah yeah totally that's my process and if i make myself sit down to do it then i'll write a song but i i don't like to make myself sit down and do it you know i feel like even for me that in a little a little bit takes some of the magic away and i want the Mm. magic to be there was it more magical when it just strikes like a thunderbolt yeah it's magical when i don't have a choice to not do it like <laughs> mike saying to you listen bro we need a tenth i've delivered six actually since the album transceiver we deliberately only write together oh however that was until covid now i've right. now i've got a handful of songs that have come during this time when we're not together all the time when, when our collective objective is not the on the forefront and even the ones we've written together sometimes those songs are like 90% mine or 90% his. We just made ourselves right together because we're a partnership and everything we do is for that partnership, you know? Yeah. And we're such different songwriters that that it did make for better songs. Yeah. We have different approaches and different styles and the way they come together is kind of, is special. For people who don't know the origin story of the Not As Jason, what is the, I mean, I may not know the origin story other than where and when. It was 1993 at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa and was he someone you knew or was he a guy down the hall you could hear or what? I, mean, I, I had a band. We didn't have any songs or gigs or a name or really even a place to play, but we were a band. There were a few of us that did different parts. I sang and we needed another guitar player and yeah. we auditioned a bunch of guitar players, but I didn't know him before. He auditioned. We accepted him into the band. He joined the band. Everyone else didn't show up. Yeah. It was just he and I still didn't have songs. We started playing songs off of a mixtape that a girlfriend had given me. And we learned all those songs. And then we literally just needed a few more songs. And I'm like, mm-hmm. man, it's too hard to learn these songs. Let's just write some. Mm-hmm. So we don't have to learn these other songs. I wrote songs because I thought it was easier than trying to learn somebody else's song. <laughs> and how many years later is it? We just celebrated our 27th anniversary. So this is our, we're going into our 20. We always talk about this is our 28th year. What's the so secret looking, though? A lot of people haven't been married that long. Neither of us have been married that long. <laughs> 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 that partnership, that marriage between Mike Butterworth and I, that, that duo has lasted longer than either of our marriages. So what's the secret? 
there really is a magic there that is unexplainable and unrepeatable. So when that magic comes together, when we're performing, when we're writing, when we're recording, when those things, when it works, it's something that's unexplainable. And so I think we both value that and realize that. And there's almost a responsibility to it a little bit, yeah. you know? Yeah. I know you have sort of milestones that you think like we opened for Bon Jovi and that sort of thing. Can you share a moment that isn't on the bio, that isn't the kind of thing that you put in a press release? That's so hard. I mean, there are thousands of those, whether they're performing in front of like a huge crowd and the roar, you know, just that swell of a crowd as one that you just are totally connected to. That's happened a lot, thankfully. Um, but even just the ability to like pull out a solid, fulfilling performance in front of like four people. Mm -hmm. I have hundreds of those stories where we showed up somewhere in Denton, Texas or Marathon, Florida, or something happened and there should have been a crowd and there wasn't. And we did it anyway. And it was all, it was all, the magic was still there. Yeah. I want to know if you've derived any applicable lessons for others. I think just the idea of thinking positive and I, I know I got this from my mom because she says mm -hmm. it all the time still, but I, I would say that's probably one of the most important things. It's amazing how many people don't. We all get kicked around. We all, you know, stumble all the time. To me, that's the difference between somebody who is succeeding and someone who isn't is just how many times you stay positive and you keep mm -hmm. trying, you know, it goes back to your question of how have we lasted this long. That's part of the answer. It's just that we kept, that we just made ourselves keep going, you know? It's not, I don't know, it's not that exciting of an answer. It's just yeah. the truth. In my head, I'm seeing you on some stretch of highway with like two blown out tires and your equipment all over the place, right? Like, I mean, there has to be moments where you've been like, uh, like my usual reserve isn't cutting it. Learning from those moments. So early, you mm. know, early flat tires, maybe where they didn't matter as much, made the bigger, worse flat tires or like bus fires or mm -hmm. album releases along with global pandemics just so many times of hitting something that you think you'll never be able to overcome and then just knowing that if you just push through you'll overcome yeah. that made all those other ones easier to do i mean it honestly benjamin has probably been a hundred flat tires yeah and so after like the first dozen flat tires eventually like well we're gonna get there one of the reasons we're talking or that i was excited to talk now is you are on the road yeah. Everyone else is locking down and you seem to have had an epiphany that you can live out of an RV and still mm -hmm. do what you're doing and you seem to be doing it pretty effectively. We sold two band vans because we knew we weren't going to be traveling as a band. We lost 50 or 60 band confirmed shows, you mm -hmm. know, over the course of a year. And so we knew we were selling those vans and I had been wanting one for a long time anyway. And I, and I really, you know, it was the longest I'd ever been home. Uh -huh in my adult life. I just knew personally, I needed to like, get out. And you know, there's a lot of responsibility there. I'm not trying to buck the rules. Yeah, we just decided we would create a scenario that we thought was safe within CDC guidelines that we could be healthy that we weren't bringing any risk to anyone else. And part of that was being self contained. No, no flying, no hotels, no restaurants. And so we bought a camper van and we just threw it out there on the internet. I said, I'll play anywhere. We started it the very first of July. I think we've spent 60 nights in mm. the uh, in the camper van since then. We've put just under 20,000 miles on that in wow. a few months. And we're just about ready to cannonball run it over to uh, Delaware and Virginia yeah. for a couple of shows. And then the next show is Albuquerque. I, I'm not going to say this is the smartest, the yeah. most efficient, um, the most cost effective, like nothing about that makes sense. But what does make sense is we're out doing what we do, my wife and I, our dogs, and bringing some joy to people, um, some normalcy. That's the thing that people keep saying is it feels so good to have live music again. And it feels really good for me, you know? Here comes the rapid fire round. You ready? You want to take a deep breath? Can we have one rule? Yeah. Don't ask me a question with the word favorite in it. <laughs> okay. Yes, go. Share a hero. Okay, the first one that popped in my mind is Jimmy Buffett, and that's embarrassing. Next. <laughs> I think it's valid. Your favorite month, top month? August. Great. What's a quote that's meaningful to you? <laughs> okay. I don't know why, but the, the rumors of my demise have been greatly. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect for you, bro. I love that. 
What's your go-to place? Like, where would you go if you could go anywhere for like a little R and R? Our Iowa Great Lakes, Okaboji. It's uh, yeah, sure. I grew up going there in the summers. Book. What's a book that you love? Well, there's this book that I that I recently repurchased to read, but I haven't started yet. I don't even remember if it's that good, but it has it has inspired me on this whole adventure we're on, and it's called Blue Highways, uh-huh. like a 1980s book about a guy who buys a van and just drives all over the country, but only on the back roads. Movie. I watched a movie when I was in high school called The American Flyers, starring Kevin Costner. I watched it 64 times, so I probably have to reference that movie. Yeah, it's a great movie, right? It's the kid from like uh, Bad News Bears, and they're they're like bike kids, right, in Indiana. Well, I don't <laughs> rock movie. They are cyclists, and they're racing in this race called the Hell of the West. And the older brother, Kevin Costner, is a renowned bike racer, and he's sort of at the end of his career. And his younger brother has no respect for him, and they bond in this movie, and they uh, they race in this race. And then I won't tell you what happens at the end. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And finally, Jace, song. Song. Well, lately it's been back to, oh my gosh, it's such a Jimmy Buffett-themed party. <laughs> I learned to play guitar. I can't, I can't believe this is the direction that's gone. But uh, I learned to play guitar with Jimmy Buffett songs. I admire his ability to build community and build yeah. a lifestyle around what he's done. And that Pyrolix of 40 really kind of speaks to me at this point in my life. Can't wait to see you in the camper van, bro. Yeah, I'll be there. Thanks for joining us, man. I'll see you in a couple of days. Thank you. Jason has said yes to all sorts of adventures, living room tours, railroad tours, solo shows from state fair to state prison. He shot everything from high V beats to Cuban beats. Sorry. I've watched him evolve and iterate from rock star to photographer, to diplomat, DJ, entrepreneur, social media manager. Always Jason leads with authenticity, understated positivity, and always with a yes, as long as it's not dumb or dangerous, as he likes to say. And the Nottas have done a ton. They've written Des Moines' official theme song, wrapped their tour bus in marketing for a local whiskey, been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Iowa. They've opened for Bon Jovi. They've done MySpace, Friendster, Pledge Music, Patreon. Every year they play the Iowa State Fair, host a summer camp, and anchor a rock and roll cruise. Above all, though, the Nottas have managed to play thousands of shows over 25 years, the kind that make Friday nights Instagram-worthy, with or without Instagram. And it all begins with yes. Because yes is courageous. Yes opens the door to newness and opportunity. It's permission to try and fail with the knowledge that you'll inevitably be transformed. When I met Jason, I was still reconciling an adolescent dream and an adult imperative. I could only see a binary, rock star, or corporate show. But Jason showed me, in deeds, not in words, that I could say yes to all of it. Husband, father, writer, runner, director, shill, and occasional rock star. Soon, I was none of the above and all of the above. Years ago, as Jason and I were waiting on a flight back to New York, he drove me to a secret spot at the edge of the Des Moines airport. This is where we used to park, he said, winking, to watch the blue lights. He popped in a new demo tape and played me a new track. Now, for a singer-songwriter with a penchant for plane crash metaphors, it was a revelation to hear Jason's new song. There was no doom and gloom, no storm and drang. In Jason's song, he'd cast the airport in the blue light of adolescent romance in paradise by the dashboard lights. Jason said yes, and that made all the difference. Stolen keys, borrowed cars, old enough to go this far. No one's here to see the stars, just the blue lights. It's a black top road to a chain link fence that moves loose. Your body was tense. A silhouette smile, face eclipsed by the blue lights. Yeah. Shine on me Let the light Shine
shine on you. Up a beaten path to a private place. Load the dash, don't show me your face. Yeah, move to me with the timid grace in the blue lights. Yeah, well, it's a secret midnight rendezvous. Just Brace yourself to keep the moving. Someone yells, hey, hey, get a room. Not the blue lights. Not the blue lights. No. Not the light. Shine on me. Let the light shine. Lights dim where the runway in I wish I knew now what I didn't back then I wouldn't give to go back again to the blue lights of the blue, blue, blue Let the light shine on me There's something else that you leave at every meeting with another person. We'll see you next time. Nanny not problem singing ba ba ba. Hold up if you wanna go and take a ride with me, baby, hit me, baby, one more time. Take a picture of you and me on the days when we were young. Singing at the top of both our lungs. <laughs> <laughs>